And there we are. We are live here with Dr. Fanula Barton talking about the toolkit that we need to get through menopause. We hear an awful lot about HRT, but there's so much else that we can do, isn't there? Yeah, I think there is. And I, I feel very passionately that actually um, HRT is an incredibly valuable um, tool to use to help um, women feel better um, as they transition through perimenopause um, and into menopause and beyond. But it's not the only thing in the toolkit. And actually, many of the things that we have readily available to us relatively inexpensively and that we can access um, much more reasonably um, can have really powerful impact on us, either on their own, in their own right, or in combination with medical treatments such as HRT or, or other medications, if that's necessary for you. Um, and um, yeah, there's, it, it, I don't think it, there's any rocket science involved, but what's I think often difficult is that sometimes utilizing the non-HRT lifestyle changes can actually be harder work. Um, it can be more difficult to make and establish and maintain lifestyle changes to support your health and well-being um, in the long term and stick to them and you know and 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 find them you know, or, or find strategies that don't feel punishing for you, actually. And, and that's why every woman is going to be very different in terms of what that toolkit looks like. Um, but, and, and, and um, you know, it, it's common sense, but perimenopause and menopause are happening to us at a time in life when we're extraordinarily busy. We're often overly stretched in a whole range of different directions. And so finding time to prioritise our health and wellbeing is notoriously difficult. Um, and then, finding yourself in a situation where you've got this enormous sort of framework of lifestyle changes that you need to instigate can actually feel quite a daunting prospect. And so um, I suppose what I try and do is to um, allow women to find small changes uh, or, or kind of direct women to, to making small changes that can have a big impact cumulatively, um, whether they're going down the medical route, um, you know, as, as well, really. Yeah. We had a lot of questions come in, so will we? Will, because you're, because you're right, listen, if somebody says you're going to, you've got to go and get fit, you've got to give up drinking, you've got to eat, you know, fifty types of different fruit and plant vegetables every week, you, and you just think this is just impossible. Just yeah. going to give it up. adds to the burden, and 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 then in some ways it's counter counterproductive. So it's about finding little things that are achievable within your lifestyle that are going to help to you know support you moving forward. Yeah. Now let's have a look at the, we had a. a got quite a long list here of them that people have said fire away fire away the one the big one the one that most people said was obviously anxiety um if you are suffering from anxiety what are some simple things you can instigate just to bring it down well i think you know anxiety in perimenopause and, and menopause is an almost universal experience i think the survey that you uh, posted about um, earlier this week indicated that you know the vast majority of women surveyed will will include anxiety as a symptom that they're experiencing I mean in many ways this is logical because anxiety is the body's very natural and normal response to something that has an uncertain outcome and so by definition going through perimenopause and hitting menopause you know we don't necessarily have certainty about what we're going to be experiencing and so anxiety is a very normal phenomenon to experience as part of it but also in the context of the other stuff that's often going on around the same time as these biological changes occurring um, and so in terms of having a kind of holistic approach to managing that anxiety um, it's really useful to actually ask a few questions about what is driving the anxiety you know a lot of women will come to me and they'll say well actually I've, I'm having regular therapy I'm getting you know, regular exercise, I'm I'm nourishing my body really effectively, I'm really prioritizing my sleep and I'm I'm doing really well from a sleep perspective, but I'm still feeling inexplicably anxious from time to time. Um, or I have other women for whom actually there is enormous amounts of extrinsic issues that are, you know, informing their anxiousness. And so asking you know, that, that question, what is it that's driving my anxiety? And it may be several different things. And in fact, it's likely to be several different things, um, as well as the biological changes, but also the response to the biological changes that we're experiencing. You know, our reproductive hormones and our sex hormones um, are inextricably linked. Um, they're both governed by, you know, various different sort of feedback loops in the body. 
um, that, 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 that utilize the hypothalamus, which is a part of the brain in order to help regulate those two hormone, two sets of hormones. And so they sort of interact and lots of stress can mean our sex hormone levels um, are lower. Um, and when our sex hormone levels are lower, it means that we're sort of more vulnerable to some of the um, impacts of stress. And it can mean that we're more likely to experience symptoms like palpitations or, um, you know, other manifestations of, of anxiousness and stress. So what we can do about it is once we are aware of what might be causing us anxiousness or anxiety, um, I think first is to sort of find a bit of peace with it um, and to acknowledge that it's OK to feel anxious about this. You know, it's not something that we need to beat ourselves up about for experiencing. Um, and I think sometimes that permission um, to experience that feeling is, is really um, the most important step. I think the other thing is then if you have scope within your lifestyle to make changes to avoid the things that are triggering anxiety, um, even if that's not permanently, if that's temporary, for example, you know, if you've got you're being pulled in all different directions and you've got extrinsic things like you know parents and, and 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 teenagers and work pressures and relationship issues you know if you can find ways of putting boundaries in so that you're not exposed to so many of those extrinsic factors then that's really useful but that isn't always available for all of the things that are going to trigger anxiousness so boundaries in what sort of boundaries are useful things to to put in because that is you know, i think I mean, even with me, especially you, you, I sit there and think, I get anxious about feeling anxious because then I think, oh, my God, my cortisol levels are up here. I'm going to have a heart attack. My blood pressure is going to go through the roof. Um, so you actually get anxiety on top of your anxiety about being anxious. So how do you sort of set those boundaries that actually sort of help you sort of bring it back down a bit? Well, I, I, as I said, I think first things first is to recognise it. And if you recognise what your symptoms of anxiety are, then as soon as it starts to build, you can say, I know what this I know what this is um, and it's OK that I'm feeling this way. And then you shouldn't then get that feedback of anxiety driving more anxiety. So feeling anxious about the anxiousness. If you can sort of sit with it and you can say this is an uncomfortable feeling, but it's something that I'm familiar with and I know that it will probably pass. Um, and in terms of what boundaries to put in, it's 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 actually being brave enough to say no to things that you know are gonna cause anxiousness. Um, and so a really common one I see in clinical practice is people becoming more anxious about things like driving or socializing. Um, and yet with our busy lives, we often feel like we have a pressure to do certain things and to still maintain this potential facade of, of, of being able to sort of cope and carry on and doing everything. Actually having the strength to say, no, I don't want to do that. It's not going to make me feel good um, is one really important sort of strategy um, in terms of putting barriers in. Um, and actually, if you put those things in place, people will really respect that and then you might find that people don't then ask too much of you or you know uh or, or lay too heavy expectations on you and it can be a really important thing to do in the workplace particularly because at this stage we're often in a, in a position in the workplace where you know it's it's natural to want to care and it's natural to want to do a good job but, but that can often give rise to lots of anxiousness um, and we often take on you know, additional work in the workplace to be able to say to people, actually, no, this is beyond my, you know, remit. It's somebody else's, you know, job to 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 stand firm on those sort of things is useful. But it also then means that the people around you won't ask you to do the things that you've said that you you you're, you're you know you're not going you're not willing to do anymore. And the same yeah. can be said of parents or children or friends. Yeah. Even things like in the workplace, we say, you know, you've got this task to do, you've got that, you've got to meet this deadline, you've got to, I mean, just sort of standing back a little bit and saying, well, hang on a second, I've got these things on my plate. Let me tick these off because otherwise I'm not going to do any of these well. Um, you know, those sorts of things would be useful as well, wouldn't they? Just sort of setting that sort of like <laughs> politely back off. Yeah, but the first thing is identifying what those elements are in the different sort of spheres of your life that are actually triggering all of it so that you know when you need to put some, you know, no's in place. I think the other really important thing, um, and it's very easy to sort of say and pay lip service to, but it's much harder to actually do, um, is to start to utilise things like self-compassion um, and self-care almost as an act of, sort of self-respect. I think we can often find ourselves at this stage of life feeling like we're the bottom of everyone's list. 
we're often the bottom of our own list that often makes us feel disempowered and like we're lacking respect from other people um, and so one of the best ways of kind of re-establishing respect from other people is it to actually make sure that you're um, you know providing yourself with a lot of respect um, and a big part of that is going to be being compassionate for the experiences and the feelings that you're having having um, and saying no it's okay that I'm upset by this because it's an upsetting thing or it's okay that I'm anxious about this because it is an uncertain thing and this is a normal phenomenon um, but also starting to care for yourself without any guilt and I think that's another really big issue that can feed into all of this we often do feel guilt about prioritizing our needs because we're so time poor often um, but it's something that's incredibly important and and the value of rest um, and rest I think we can often think of self-care as having a bath a bubble bath with you know, uh, you know a nice coffee and a book and some relaxing music that's not what self-care is not to everybody it might be to some people but it's about tuning into what actually nourishes you as an individual and that might not be a bath I hate having a bath it makes me feel really uneasy getting in the bath because I'm cold but you know self-care for me is taking a long walk ideally in sunshine and not in rain um, and so your self-care is going to look very different um, depending on you know which day it is and, and and what the weather's like and you know what your needs and and um and once are at that point um and well, trying to to you. i had a really lo a very lovely lady was saying to me said i've done absolutely nothing today and i thought good on you because <laughs> she was going, how often? You, know, you could tell she was feeling real, really guilty because she's done absolutely nothing. She's actually got a sinus infection. She's not really feeling very well. She was feeling guilty about doing nothing. I think, you go, girl. Every so mm -hmm. often it's a really good thing to actually do nothing. I used to call them duvet days in Australia where you just sort of like, you know, once a year you just have that day where you just sort of go, you know, I'm just not getting up today. I'm just not yeah. I'm okay. But I think we're conditioned to... Um, to to feel like we need to fill that time with something purposeful um or indeed on the contrary like we find we have maybe a pocket of time in order to take some rest but you fill it with something that you know needs doing um because let's be let's face it there's always something that needs doing um so it's about kind of trying to weave that self-care and those little sort of pockets of rest into the reality of uh, ultimately what is likely to be a very a, a very busy life um and actually on that point of purpose I think one of the other things that can often drive anxiety for some people is when their purpose is shifting. Um, and mm -hmm. this can often happen in um, people whose family dynamics are changing. Um, and, you know, for example, I see lots of women who've got sick and elderly parents and they may be grieving for an, uh, you know, a parent who's unfortunately passed away, but their lives have been completely overwhelmed and priori in, in, priorities, in prioritizing that parent's need. And when when that person is no longer around or if children have flown the nest, actually it can really change that sense of purpose. And I think that plays into an even bigger issue in terms of this is a phase of life where our lives, are, 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 are who we are and our identity is changing. Um, and we need to be tuning into the kind of person that we want to be and actually pausing and taking stock and saying, well, how do I feel about what's going on right now? And what do I want the next five years, 10 years, 15 or, or 35 years um, to look like? And what's the sort of person that I need to be? And actually, it, 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 we often, a lot of people get a bit stuck. And so it's useful to take advice, to talk to a therapist, to talk to a coach, to talk to a personal stylist, if you've completely lost what your sense of style or, or, or fashion is, in order to kind of garner some of that confidence again. <laughs> The, um, on here a little while, Menopause Canada was saying there's an app there that she was looking at that she says over in Canada that it's called Anxiety Canada. It's a web Canada and it's a website and an app. It has lots of um, free ideas and things for reducing anxiety. Do we have similar things here? Or is, or, I'm not going to say is that worth looking at because you probably don't know about it, but I'm sure if she's saying it is, it probably is. Um, do we have similar apps and things? Oh, no, we do. And I think this is the thing. There are so many resources available. We are living in unprecedented times where we have access to so many fantastic resources, but, and this is a big but, when we have so much access to so many things, actually it's really hard to find the thing that is going to be useful for us. Um, and so that's why actually before you go diving into websites and apps and you know downloading a mindfulness app or the Calm Sleep app or whatever, you actually identify what it is that you really need to address rather than kind of sticking sticking classes all over the place but not actually necessarily identifying what the roots 
of the issues are. Um, and I, you know, I can't, I can't encourage people enough to seek talking therapy. Um, I think that it's um, a really underutilized tool. And I think that, you know, in the States, people are much more um, au fait with having a therapist throughout their entire lives often. And it's something that we still aren't quite you know, used to here in the UK, um, I actually think having some proactive talking therapy, even if you're not experiencing grief or trauma or psychological difficulty necessarily, actually having some talking therapy to talk through some of these big things that are happening to us, both physically and um, circumstantially and psychologically, um, is a really valuable thing. The biggest issue with that is accessing it because, you know, NHS services are hugely overwhelmed. Every NHS um, locality, you can access psychological services through something called IAPT, um, IAPT, uh, um, Increasing Access to Psychological Therapies. And if you Google IAPT in your local area, you will be able to find um, your local IAP service, which normally people can self-refer to. Um, and there are often waiting lists. Um, aside from that, obviously, there are a whole host of private um, therapists that you can access. Um, and there are a couple of really, um, so the, the British Psychological Society, they have a postcode search for psychologists, clinical psychologists in your area, um, or organisations like the BACP, for example, British Association of Counselling Psychotherapists is another great resource to find somebody if you're willing to go privately um, and to fund some of that yourself. And, I, you know, coaches, I think a lot of people, have access to professional coaches through their workplace. Um, I'd say encourage that as, mu as much as possible. If you don't have that um, through a workplace scheme, think about finding a coach outside um, in some way who can just help with a lot of people. actually has qualifications. I mean, there are so many people popping up like mushrooms all over the place at the moment, calling themselves menopause coaches. I've got no idea what type of qualifications they actually have. A lot of them don't seem to have any except they went through menopause. Yeah. Um, and Which I think that you do, so you do have to be careful. Psychological problems. If you've got psychological, you know, if you've got anxiety, I actually think seeing a, 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 a psychotherapist or a clinical psychologist is probably the best thing to do because yeah. they can sort of talk you through clinical psychologists, particularly, they will have access to all the different modalities of psychological therapy and they'll be able to kind of, um, you know, find a treatment strategy that's that's specific to to your individual needs, dependent on your situation and circumstances. Yeah, there was another point back here that somebody made, which is a, is, is um, that it just takes so long to feel any difference. Too are there? I mean, do you, is it going to take forever to to feel less anxious? Can you feel incrementally less anxious? And what what should people expect when they're trying to reduce their anxiety in terms of feeling better? Well, I think it is going to take a long time. And actually, hand on heart, if I'm really honest, I think HRT is the probably the best way of managing perimenopausal and menopausal anxiety because it is going to treat an enormous um, element of the root cause of the issues. Um, I think the other um, you know, group of medications that can be invaluable in this um, instance are the SSRI medications, the so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, so not HRT medications, um, but they're medications that have been designed to essentially modify the way the central nervous system manages its own serotonin um, in order to try and improve um, anxiety states and improve mood often. Um, and they're enormously valuable and actually I would say life saving in, in many instances, you know, um, and they won't work instantly. Um, but they will work quickly um, if you've got, um, you know, if you've reached a bit of a crisis point, actually. Um, but they work best alongside a talking therapy approach, which is going to get to the root cause of the problem, um, you know, and the, the you know, the anti-anxiety medications are going to help you to feel less weighed down by the difficulties that you're facing whilst you then go through that sort of more therapeutic process um and they are you know medications there's broad, broad range of them lots of different ones some of them are better than others um it's often not a one-size-fits-all approach it's often a trial and error situation to find the right one and the right dose that suits each individual um but you know there is increasing um, evidence to suggest that actually psychological therapies are the best way of managing things like mood disorders um, and anxiety disorders, um, either you know in in premenopause or in perimenopause or menopause. But they take time, and it 
it's going to take a week, month potentially to start to feel better from that. But what I would say is sometimes the act of taking control and making a decision and putting a plan in place can itself feel really empowering. Um, and that's a really important you know, element of this is being in control because anxiety is, you know, a symptom or is a manifestation of when we're experiencing something that we that feels uncertain. So any ability to regain control in those circumstances is really important. A lot of people are a bit scared of them. Um, when you say talking therapies, I think they're going to have to be, you know, lying down on the couch and spilling their every childhood trauma that they ever had. But a lot of it is much more, is quite practical, a lot of it, isn't it? So then like CBT is really about refocusing the way you think about things in a lot of ways you don't have to worry about your childhood trauma particularly it's more about you know if you think i can't drive because i'm going to kill myself going on the, on the highway then they'll sort of go through sort of thinking about you know, how realistic do you actually think that's going to be so you question your thought process till you come to a point actually where you kind of think well actually i'm probably unlikely to kill myself really in reality so you know you could you can take that step forward so it's not really just a matter of, of spilling your guts as we would say down under um it's it, it's far it's really quite different isn't it? it's very practical isn't very it? different and you know there are several new kind of generations of cbt as it were um, i'm not a psychotherapist or a clinical psychologist so i'm not you know familiar with all of them but things like acceptance and commitment therapy for example or um there are newer sort of forms of really short in, uh, you know sort of um a brief intervention psychological therapies that can be really useful particularly for managing specific issues like fear of driving or fear of flying and that sort of thing but also there's an abundant amount of research supporting the use of specific cbt techniques for things like um insomnia which is obviously an enormous issue for a huge number of people in perimenopause menopause um, um and hot flushes now the kind of the, the, you know that that triad of uh, of symptoms in menopause the night sweats um insomnia and then um brain fog actually if you think cbt can help with treating flushes you know in a, in a pretty reasonable way that then can mean that you sleep better and um, cbt can also be really helpful at helping with getting to sleep and staying to sleep and giving you um useful strategies to do that then it, it's logical that actually using those kind of um therapies is, is really useful for the whole uh, sort of uh, you know that that's holistic approach but yeah you're right cbt um, and some of the other more specific psychological therapies it, it doesn't involve you know delving deep into your childhood um you know counseling um and psychotherapy are more likely to involve those kind of conversations um and a lot of people find great value in that in offloading particularly if they're holding um a lot of trauma or grief that they haven't necessarily had the chance to deal with um because we know actually again there's lots of research to suggest that women who've experienced um adverse life events and lots of trauma through their life are more likely to experience um more difficult perimenopause and menopausal symptoms this was something that the Fawcett society report when they did their big survey um noted um yeah. and it's why there can be a big disparity in terms of social economic um groups in terms of you know the different experiences that women have so yeah it depends on the circumstances <laughs> but you don't have to be talking about everything if yeah. you've got specific things that need to be dealt with with therapy yeah low mood is another one then that people came in coming on we'll stick with we'll stick with the moody bits first um low mood and loss of interest in life anhedonia i believe is the um is the is the word for that are there things that we can do that will help improve our mood as well yeah i think so and i think um that simple things are really important i think sometimes we often get lost in you know the 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 busyness of modern day life and we can lose track of the things that help us to feel good i think you know we're on social media right now and i think that social media has huge parts play in in people's mental health to be honest um yeah. i've had a pretty extended break from social media recently and i'm feeling so much better for it um <laughs> i think we can sometimes get kind of stuck in the scroll thinking that we're doing something but actually um it's not it's not nourishing us necessarily in a, in, a, in a particularly good way. Um, in terms of low mood and having a loss of interest, um, I would suggest, you know, gently trying to do as many of the things that you think you might enjoy doing 
um, in a kind of graded way. And I think that, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody to go out and start exercising, you know, frantically five times a week. But we know that moving and exercising is enormously beneficial for um, mood. It really improves things like your endorphins and your serotonin levels in a really nice, natural way. Um, so going for a walk on a regular basis is probably the easiest, cheapest and most accessible thing that women can can start to do. It can be difficult to get a walk in if you're busy working or caring for people. Um, but there's probably always an opportunity at some point in your day. Um, and it's something that I talk about in workplaces, like getting workplaces to really encourage people to go out for a walk at various different times of day at lunchtime, um, ideally. Because if you can be doing some sort of form of movement outdoors, um, where you're being exposed to daylight um, is also really good for your mood. And the earlier in the day you can expose yourself to daylight, the better as well, because that will kickstart melatonin production, which is important for developing sleep pressure um, over the course of the day. Um, and when you've got sufficient amounts of melatonin building over the day, you're more likely to get off to a better um, and deeper, more restful night's sleep. And of course, if you can get a better night's sleep, more likely to be able to manage your mood and feel more positive the following day um, and so it comes down to those really boring fundamentals ultimately of kind of moving prioritizing sleep thinking about how you can manage some of the extrinsic or int intrinsic stresses um, and also thinking about nourishing yourself well um, and um, again it can be hard because when life is difficult we often slip back into patterns of behavior that make us feel good and comfort food is called comfort food for a reason you know often when we've got low estrogen levels actually we crave things like carbohydrates which is normal um but if you're choosing you know carbohydrates that are rich in um uh, processed sugars and and you know other chemical additives that's not going to be good for you in terms of your brain function your energy levels and things in the long term so you know trying to avoid processed sugar refined sugar is a really important thing to do for your for your mental health um but also avoiding alcohol um and it's a really unpopular thing to say but i think it's really important because you know, alcohol is the most socially acceptable drug and it's readily available in every supermarket um, and in many other places as well. And um, and it, it may make you feel temporarily more at ease. It may soothe something, but actually it's going to be doing profoundly more harm in the long term in terms of your, you know, mental health and depressive symptoms, but also your metabolic health your cardiovascular health and all of those other things in, in the longer term too. So I would say if you have problems with low mood, it's really important to think about your relationship with alcohol um, and maybe think about whether that can be adjusted. Um, again, you know, uh, looking at those other lifestyle changes to consider, um, but also connection. Um, and I think one of the things that can often be overlooked is the power of community and the power of feeling connected to other people, both um, you know, verbally, so, you know, by phone or in person, speaking to people or by text or email, just reaching out and having conversations with people, but also the power of, of human touch. And this is something that I think, you know, we were all relatively starved of during the pandemic. So we only got to see, you know, a select group of people. And a lot of people were incredibly isolated during that period of time. You know, a hug um, stimulates some really, really important happy hormones. Um, <clears throat> And it doesn't even need to be a full blown hug, you know, an embrace or, you know, just that human connection, um, I think, can be a really powerful way of helping to boost your mood. But when you're feeling very low, it can be very dispiriting to reach out to other people, um, you know, if you're feeling isolated and you've completely lost interest in everything. So I hope some of those tips are helpful. Yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? You mentioned alcohol there, which leads me quite happily into um, palpitations. Yes. Um, yes. What are, what are, you know, with, with hormones and, and menopause, what are some of the main causes of pal palpitations and what role does alcohol play? So, I mean, low estrogen can cause or, or can give rise to symptoms of palpitations. It's one of the, the common sort of perimenopause, menopausal symptoms. But it's also important to remember that palpitations might be a symptom of an underlying cardiological problem. Um, and so anybody who's experiencing palpitations, I would encourage you, even if you think it's all part of your perimenopause or menopause, um, <clears throat> 
it is really important to ensure that that is investigated um, uh, thoroughly because cardiovascular disease is still one of the leading causes of mortality and morbidity in women. Um, and we know that when oestrogen is low, um, we um, you know, are at an increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease. So any cardiac symptoms need to be taken incredibly seriously. Um, it's also important to just bear in mind at this point that women tend to have quite different symptoms to like ischemic heart disease than than men do, you know, we think of the classic symptoms of sort of central crossing chest pain, but actually sometimes women won't experience central, trusting, uh, central crushing chest pain with a cardiological uh, problem. They might experience nausea, they might experience dizziness, they might experience um, back pain, um, pain radiating into the arm. Um, so I think it's really important to just be aware of your cardiovascular health um, and, you know, have any symptoms that might um, indicate heart issues investigated thoroughly. If they're all, if all your tests are all normal and clear and you're reassured that there isn't a cardiological problem, then yeah, the likelihood is it's something to do with oestrogen and stress hormones and <laughs> from anxiety because we know that, you know, lots of excess adrenaline and cortisol um, can and, you know, and, and for a good reason, you know, when, when we are running from the tiger at the cave door, what we need is our heart to beat quickly and strongly in order that we can power our muscles to run away nice and quickly. So it's a, you know, it, it's an adaptation that we've developed that is 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 keeping us safe ultimately. Um, but when we're not having to run from a tiger at the cave door, actually it can provide, you know, a lot of anxiety, additional anxiety. When you're woken up in the middle of the night with palpitations, it's a horrible, horrible experience. Um, so alcohol can play a really um, big part in this. Um, and particularly for sort of nocturnal palpitations. And so I think if you're experiencing that, then the most sensible thing to do is to cut back or think about abstaining from alcohol for a while and see actually if that helps to settle things. Um, you said, waking up in the night with that pumping, thumping. Yeah, so when you, uh, and, um, uh, you know, plus minus hot flushes, so palpitations and hot flushes are sort of manifestations of, of similar biological changes to the cardiovascular system. So um, any of those symptoms are going to be much worse um, with alcohol, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, thinking about a period off. And, and if you're somebody who's been, you know, who's enjoyed a lot of alcohol in the past and you're having heart issues, then it's important again to get that looked at because alcohol can sometimes make heart problems much worse. Yeah, I can say I have cut back massively now because, you know, over, over COVID, we just got silly. I mean, it, it really just, you know, it started off with, you know, one bottle and then you look at it and go, by, by the end of the first year, it was like a bottle and a half. By the end of the second year, it was two bottles. It was, oh my God, did we just actually drink two bottles of wine? And so, and I was waking up with those thumping chest pains and I'm not pains, but the thumping heart. And I've, really, I've massively cut back now and, and they've gone. Mm. That's a good thing. So it does show that, you know, that, you know, Taking a couple of simple things, and not not necessarily. I mean, you don't have to completely go teetotal, do you? But just sort of cut it, just cut it down to what would be considered a reasonable yeah. level. And I think, too- uh, you know, we, we know that alcohol is not good for us in a whole host of ways. And I think historically, there's been this notion that there's a sort of J J shaped curve with alcohol consumption, and actually, a little bit of alcohol can be helpful for us. You know, the Mediterranean diet. Um, and I think the jury is still out, actually, as to whether that is genuinely true. Um, you know, I'll hold my hands up, say I enjoy a glass of wine. I am not, uh, you know, sober. I'm not teetotal. Um, but there is mounting amounts of research evidence that would suggest that any alcohol is actually bad for us in the, you know, short and the long term. Um, so I do think it's a really important conversation to be having with yourself about, <laughs> um, you know, what what's important to you. Um, and certainly if that drinking alcohol alcohol is causing you to feel more unwell then absolutely think about and it doesn't have to be uh, you know it doesn't have to be abstaining completely like you said and it doesn't have to be forever but like actually if you did like a two three week trial and just see how much better you might feel then that might that might really hammer at home and, and give you the information that you need in order to then inform a decision about what you want to do in the long term yeah yeah exactly um joint pain this was another one that a lot of people put high on their list of things that they wanted to know what they could do about what helps with joint pain so i would say um anybody who's got joint pain symptoms please make sure you're taking vitamin d um, and please make sure that you're taking um, adequate calcium in your diet 
Um, a lot of people find that they get sort of sensitivity to dairy and things at this phase of life. And so a lot of people I come across have cut dairy out of the diet. And often people are getting plenty of calcium from other sources in the diet, but it's just really important to make sure uh, that that's happening. Vitamin D is really, really important. It's a sunshine hormone. And of course, over the winter months, none of us get enough. Um, I would recommend a thousand units a day. Um, on a daily basis, lifelong. If you don't want to be taking something daily, get a higher dose and take it less frequently. So 5,000 units a couple of times a week, something along those lines. Um, and that will help um, with both your um, bone mineral density, but it can also help to, to ease sort of joint pain symptoms. Movement is really important. So, you know, doing things like Pilates to strengthen um, your skeleton and to provide you with stability in your skeleton so that you're not having so much pressure going through some of the joints. If you've got things like osteoarthritis, for example, I think exploring any joint pain that is associated with swelling and stiffness um, it's really important to rule out other things like rheumatoid arthritis or other connective tissue diseases that might need a very different medical approach. It's really important that they're not ignored. Um, and, you know, using things um, like um, uh, uh, chondroitin supplements. So, you know, there are lots of, there's not a huge amount of high powered research evidence um, supporting the, the glucosamine and chondroitin, but a lot of people find them enormously beneficial. So they're not necessarily going to do a huge amount of harm. So it might be worthwhile adding it in. You've gone on, you've gone alien on me. Can you hear me? Hello, hello. Oh, looks like we've lost it. Uh, should you take vitamin T? David Kaner, that's a very, very good question. Have we lost you? Have we lost you? Can we come back in? Let me see. Can you hear me? Hang on. Hello. Say, you're back. Good. <laughs> good. Tell me to move closer to my router, but I'm right next to my router, so I'm sorry if that was me. <laughs> that's all right. Um, we have a question there. Should you take vitamin D with vitamin K in it? You can do, there's a theory that it helps to improve absorption. So if you can get a D with K, then fine, but you don't have to have it with vitamin K. You can just have it as vitamin D on its own. Um, and it doesn't need to be an expensive, you know, fancy supplement. Vitamin D is vitamin D. And actually, you know, you just need to be getting some of it on a regular basis. Um, and remembering to do it every day is quite hard. So that's why I take a high dose maybe once a week so that I can know <laughs> I get my dose in without having to worry too much about it. What about, this is the other um, thing that uh, some people say helps with their joints, collagen supplements. What do you think? Yeah, so I think I was, I was trying to talk about collagen when we got uh, when we got knocked off. But um, so again, there is more and more research coming out around the use of collagen. Obviously, it's something that's relatively new. Um, and historically, there wasn't a great deal of data supporting its use, um, you know, for joint pain symptoms. And that would still be the case now in terms of high quality research data. Um, um, and so it is expensive. It's another thing to add to the to-do list that doesn't taste great. Let's be honest. It's either bovine or fish based and neither of them taste particularly good in your coffee. However, they tell you they're going to, you know, it's going to taste in the, in the marketing. Um, so if you're taking it just for your joints, I would say you're probably not going to see a huge amount of benefit. Um, but if you're looking at it for other reasons as well, so things like hair, skin, nails and, you know, joints, then it might be worthwhile exploring. But you need to be taking high dose. So um, I think probably it's I think it's like a thousand um, milligrams or even two thousand milligrams um, or maybe even more. Actually, I uh, don't quote me on that. I think you need to be taking much more than what you would. Oh, yeah, that, that thousand of micronized, you know, incredibly small size minuscule Daltons of, uh, yeah. of bovine So the capsules and the liquids tend not to have enough in them. So most, if you're going to go, you need to go for a powder that you need to be using like two big scoopfuls a day, which yeah. it's, a, it's an undertaking and it's very expensive, whereas it's vitamin D, not so much. Yeah, exactly. Um, dry eyes, that was another one that people, dry eyes drive me batty. Mad. I dry eyes. When I lived in Moscow, and you know, when it was you know below zero, I'd go outside and I'd actually literally have frozen tears down the side of my face. It drives me absolutely nutty. What what can you do about dry up dry eyes? Um, so I mean, lubricating eye drops is number one, and something that's got a high hyaluronic acid content in it is what I would suggest. Um, there's loads of different ones on the market, and it's about finding the ones that suit you um, and your needs best. My favourite is Theolos Duo, just because it's got 0. Um, I think 0.3% hyaluronic acid in it, and it seems to be the one that helps with my eyes the best. 
but you need to be consistent and it can't just be putting your drops in every so often you need to be putting your drops in sometimes four or more times a day in order to keep that film um you know of hydration across the surface and certainly winter time when obviously you're going out into cold weather that's going to trigger more water tear production um so you need to be upping the um, frequency of drops um in in those times what i would also say is anybody who might have allergic eye disease it's really important that you also consider allergic eye drops because you know as we hit spring a lot of people will find that their eye symptoms are much worse um and that's because they're probably an element of allergic eye disease as well as so allergic conjunctivitis as well as having dry eyes the two are often in combination um other things that ophthalmologists will recommend are regular um warm compresses um in order to try and stimulate um you know production of the the, the, the you know the important fluid that we need to kind of keep the eye lubricated but again in order to do that you need to be doing it four times a day with an eye compress on for five minutes who's got you know time to be five minutes on your eyes four times a day it's mm -hmm. it's very difficult to achieve um the other thing that um i see a lot in i was just asking you what were the name of the eye drops again please um, so the ones that i really like theolos duo they're called they're quite expensive um but an ophthalmologist recommended them to me and i've been using them ever since and i think that they are the best of the ones i've tried but obviously it, it, it everyone's going to be slightly different um Theolos, yeah, T H E O L O Z and Duo, D U O. Um, but omega three supplements can also be quite useful. So this is another thing, you know, you know, a fish oil supplement because you know, much as we can all try and eat two portions of oily fish a week, it's sometimes not available um, or easy to do. Um, so sometimes taking a fish oil supplement or an omega three, you know, uh, a plant based omega three or omega six supplement might be a useful thing to consider as well, because that can be really good for eye symptoms, also quite good for brain fog symptoms. <laughs> That's good to know. That is good to know. Um, question here, moving on from eyes. Oh, the other thing about them, somebody's in omega sevens as well. C buckthorn apparently is quite yeah. good for um, muco mucosal tissue, vaginas and, and eyes. Um, and the question you'll be having, one person coming in asking about the migraines, what can help? And another one here saying, what's good for headaches that they can use that is going to, because um, God, headaches are annoying. They and are. They around, my, around menopause. They do. And again, I think um, it sounds like a cop out, but actually trying to identify what is triggering them um, is really important and actually in perimenopause and menopause it's likely that an element of it is is estrogen related um or related to you know uh, fluctuating or low levels of, of, of hormones um and so hrt can be a really useful thing to consider in these instances and i think um, what's a really important point to make is a lot of women who um have migraine which is a chronic neurological disorder and migraine is very different to headaches um a lot of women who suffer with migraine have been told they can't have estrogen their entire lives because um, estrogen orally um, increases the risk of clots developing in the in the bloodstream and if you have migraine and you have clots in your blood you're more likely to have a stroke which is why you know women who have suffered with migraines particularly migraine with aura which is an unusual sensory experience um come and they say well i've been told i can't have estrogen and actually they can have hrt because they can have transdermal estrogen in HRT, which goes through the skin. It's not metabolized in the liver in the same way as oral estrogen. So there's a much lower risk of any venous thromboembolic problems happening. And therefore um, there's no significant increased stroke risk associated with using the estrogen through the skin in, in women who suffer with migraine. So that's a really important point to make because I see so many women who come to me and they say, oh, oh I can't have estrogen because of my migraines and actually it's really important to know that people with migraine can have hrt through the skin um the second thing um is tension so one of the other really common symptoms in perimenopause menopause is actually muscle tension um and particularly if you you know you're working at a desk or you're on your phone all the time we'll often develop a lot of muscle tension in the neck so really important to be thinking about posture so pilates or maybe even thinking about deep tissue massage seeing a physiotherapist to see if there are any specific movements that you need to be doing the one I'm supposed to do that I never do is that really ugly one where you have to kind of keep pushing. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, I that, and I never do it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's a really common one. Making sure that your pillows are like, adequately supportive so that you're not cricking your neck and things like that um, at night. Looking at whether there are any food triggers and whether that needs to be avoided. Looking at alcohol, because that can also be um, a, a big trigger for headache symptoms. Um, and, um, and really... Um, 
first of all, just going up your analgesic ladder and, and taking paracetamol. And if paracetamol isn't working, think about anti-inflammatory medications and things like ibuprofen. Um, if ibuprofen isn't working, talking to your doctor about getting stronger versions of ibuprofen. Um, if you suffer with migraine, being on a triptan medication or having readily ready access to triptan medication in frequent, you know, uh, repeat prescriptions is really important. If you're on a triptan and it's not working, ask for a different one or a higher strength one. Um, and then there are um, other things like anti-epileptic medications um, that, can, that can be used sometimes to, to help with um, migraines. Um, there is also prophylactic medications and things like beta blockers that can be quite useful, um, but can often come with really horrible side effects. With migraine now, there are also lots of very interesting experimental treatments. So it might be worthwhile speaking to a migraine specialist and the National Migraine Centre in London is a really useful place to go. It's a charity um, and you can um, make an appointment to see somebody there and they can give you advice about what might help for you. Um, I've seen patients who've had various different uh, nerve root injections or Botox injections and things that have you know, been enormously beneficial. So there are lots of options. I think it's really important that women who suffer with migraine don't feel like they don't have any options. Um, and then, you know, it's a headache, simple things really is, is trying to avoid any neck tension and then taking simple analgesia when they happen. But overtaking or, or taking too much analgesia can make headache symptoms, you know, a lot worse. So you can get something called a, a medication overuse headache. And that can be a big problem too. <laughs> so. Go on, I know that. Um, jaws as well, because we've got a lot of tension in the jaw as well, do not we? That's something that has to be. Yeah, and you know, if you think that you have got joint tension in your jaw, see a dentist, make sure that you don't need to have a mouth guard or anything that might help with your jaw um, at, at night. Um, and, you know, if you're feeling stressed and anxious and worried, and we often hold it there, don't we? Um, so, you know, thinking about proactively managing that element of things, which obviously we talked about a lot at the beginning. Yeah. Um, looking at my list here, fatigue, that lack of energy, um, what can people do to make themselves feel like they have more energy? Um, again, I think going back to basics and first of all, looking at sleep, you know, is the fatigue coming from poor quality sleep? Um, is it coming from another undiagnosed issue? So, you know, taking stock, maybe getting a few checks done, having a blood pressure check, making sure that your lipids are normal, your HbA1c is normal. You can you usually get that from your NHS doctors as part of a health check. Um, and um, looking at your sleep quality. Just, just so people know what you're talking about, that's your blood sugars, isn't it? So if you're indicating whether yeah. or not you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, which makes yeah. you quite morbid. Because I think if your blood sugar levels are on the high side, that can often, you know, contribute to feeling, you know, very sluggish and it can make our organs work less efficiently and more sluggishly, which can then have the overall effect of us making, uh, of us feeling quite tired. Um, but tackle sleep. So if, even if you're getting sufficient hours at night, actually maybe thinking about, um, getting some sort of tracker to see are you actually getting good quality sleep is there anything you can be doing to improve your quality of sleep so I've lots of people say I sleep eight hours but they're snoring um, and if they're snoring it's likely that actually then they're, they're not getting sufficient oxygen for several hours of the of the night and so addressing that is really important you might need to go off and see an ENT doctor or a respiratory physician if you are somebody who's snoring or it doesn't even need to be actual snoring it's just if you're unable to breathe effectively through your nose and you end up mouth breathing at night that can have a profound effect as well so um asking your partner to just observe if you've got a partner or you know being aware of whether you are potentially not sleeping you know deeply and trying to address that as much as possible because that's a big issue in terms of fatigue um, and then looking at your nutrition i think there is so much that can be done in order to improve our energy levels um, you know, taking out the things that are likely to be making us feel more lethargic at so any processed sugar, um, you know, and um, and alcohol um, and thinking about whether that can improve our energy levels and then slowly reintroducing activities, um, as I said, taking a walk um, or whatever feels available. And that doesn't need to be 45 minutes around the woods. It can be five minutes around the block, but just doing small things incrementally over time to build up. Um, and that's the advice that, you know, um, we're giving a lot of people who have long COVID symptoms is, you know, gradually increasing um, activity levels over time. But I, there is no magic bullet, unfortunately. The other thing I would suggest is making sure that you've got vitamin D. If you're not taking it for joints, if you're if you're tired, I would suggest some vitamin D. Um, and probably yeah. worthwhile getting a full set of blood tests to just explore what else might be causing your tiredness and things like iron deficiency, thyroid deficiencies. Um, you know, there are a whole load of different things that can cause fatigue. And it's really important at this stage of life to make sure we haven't missed anything else. 
Yeah, yeah, because there's a lot of um, anemia around menopause as well, isn't it? That, yes, isn't particularly it? if you've got menorrhagia, so heavy periods in that sort of perimenopausal kind of chaos phase. Um, but even if you don't have heavy periods, it's very, um, it, it isn't unusual to, to develop an iron deficiency or an anemia. Um, but if you're anemic, that needs to be investigated. You need to understand why you're anemic. Um, in order that that can be treated appropriately, because sometimes it can be a, a signal of a more serious underlying illness. So, you know, for example, cancers can often manifest or can often present with an anemia. Yeah, or even pernicious anemia, which apparently is yeah. diagnosed mostly around the age of 60 or so. Um, question here from Anne when we're talking about dryness and stress and those sorts of things just going on is Anne is saying can stress impact on vaginal atrophy so we get a lot of vaginal dryness we get a lot of vaginal problems all of these sorts of things can stress actually make it worse do you think? I think it probably can I'm not entirely sure of the mechanism by which that happens um, but I, you know I think that if that's what you're experiencing then that's likely to be um, an issue we know that stress can you know, drive inflammation um, non-specifically in the body. And when we've got um, elevated inflammatory markers or we've got, you know, elevated um, stress hormones through the body, we are more likely to develop autoimmune conditions. Um, and, you know, it, so it's logical then that, that, that it's something that can be made worse by stress. But there isn't a kind of defined sort of direct pathway, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, but possibly several indirect pathways by which additional stress can make um, atrophic, you know, atrophic changes worse. Yeah. Now, if, if people don't know about topical vaginal estrogen by now, they should, because obviously that is the first line place that you would go with, um, with vaginal atrophy and those sorts of things. But are there other things? Because my God, if you walk down a supermarket shelf or if you, luckily you've been off social media for a while because you probably missed 20 million new products to fix your vagina or your vaginal atrophy containing things that you would just think should never go anywhere near your skin, let alone your labia or inside your vagina. Um, so are there things that you could recommend that can at least, you know, help things, especially if people are at that point where they're so sore, so red, um, that even putting a vest on hurts? Yeah. So I think that, again, you know, going back to basics and, and thinking about hygiene, making sure that you're not using any um, feminine hygiene products that have been sold to you because the marketeers have told you you need it. No, you can wash with water. You don't need to use anything that's perfumed or soapy or that's going to lather because that's more likely to make things worse. Um, again, thinking about what lubricant you're using if you are managing to be intimate um, and thinking about your underwear, making sure that it's a natural fibre as much as possible. Um, if you are having to wear liners of any description, so things like um, panty liners if you're bleeding or if you're having any incontinence symptoms as part of your um, atrophic changes then often women are wearing a liner and that actually that contact with the muco you know with the vulval and vaginal mucosa with the, the liner itself um, can be a very irritant one um, if it is very very red and sore one of the things to consider is actually using barrier cream so you know things like pseudocream or papanthum, which we use to protect, you know, very fragile, um, you know, skin and mucosa in babies when they've got a nappy on. Um, it's not the same situation in any way, shape or form, but actually a lot of those products have got, um, you know, non-medicinal um, elements in them. So things like zinc, for example, that can be really helpful at providing a barrier and stopping the urine from being in contact with the vulnerable mucosa, which can often be enormously irritant and, and, and uncomfortable. Um, and then trying to sort of fix that inflammation before then going in too heavily with, you know, um, you know, anything else that might become um, uncomfortable or sting. And um, I think if you've got problems, it's important to be examined um, because it's important that a doctor has a look and make sure that there isn't anything else of concern, like a chronic inflammatory disease um, or an infection that might need to be treated um, or something that might actually need steroids to help get it under control, um, either before or alongside using your vaginal estrogens. Yeah, there's actually an interesting product that um, Volvo Cancer Awareness recommends um, called Emelin, which is a, a, it's actually a little spray and it's, it's literally just liquid paraffin. So you don't even have to touch yourself if you've been Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. And nobody knows what it is. You can carry it in your bag and nobody's got any idea. And just, you know, go to the roof, put it in the salt, give it a little spray and, and, and away you go. And, um, yeah, she swears by that. She thinks that that's, um, you know, for somebody with vulval cancer to, to recommend, I think that's probably not a, not a bad thing. There's nothing in it except for the liquid paraffin, really. That's it. Yeah, that sounds like a great product because that's going to help to provide soothing um, but also that really important barrier. And until we 
like until you sort of get that in integrity of that barrier back it's very difficult to then treat and get things feeling better um and so if things aren't feeling better with whatever standard vaginal estrogen that you've been prescribed then it's really important to go back and have an examination and you might even need to be referred to a vulval specialist in order for them to give you the full kind of you know viewpoint on what's useful i've got um, a local gynae consultant who works near to where i practice who really swears by um, organic coconut oil um, and um, a lot of you know other consultants who I've worked with also really um, support its use um, and you know again it's an inexpensive product it's a natural product it's something that can be very soothing um, without necessarily causing any additional harm but again it's something that is an individual um, you know preference often some people don't get on with it because it can feel quite oily and very very messy which can often then put people off uh, unfortunately. Yeah, that's true. Well, it is gaining. It's gaining a lot of. Before we used to say never raid your kitchen cupboards for something, but that seems to be the exception from the kitchen cupboard. There was a question back here a minute ago, which was actually about ferritin levels. Um, at what level would you be worrying about what your ferritin level was? So the NHS kind of cutoffs are around fifteen. Like if you're under fifteen, that would be low. But actually you know, for various other different things. So I've had a bit of a hair loss journey myself recently. Really? Um, and, you know, for hair loss, if you've got hair loss symptoms, anything under 100 is thought to be a low ferritin. Wow. Um, so I think it, it really depends on the circumstances. Um, iron is quite difficult to take as a supplement. It's notoriously difficult to tolerate and can often end up causing things like constipation. So um, it is something to have a discussion with with a doctor about. But, um, yeah, I would say um, if your ferritin is above 15 and your haemoglobin level is normal, you probably don't need to worry too much about there being a significant underlying health issue. If your ferritin is low um, and your haemoglobin is low and you've got other markers so like your total iron binding capacity or your total iron, um, uh, if they're abnormal as well, um, then, you know, more likely that that needs to be investigated in a little bit more detail. Likewise, if you've got issues with liver function alongside things like ferritin issues, then again, it's something that needs to be considered by um, by, by your doctor or by um, a specialist by referral if necessary. Um, but yeah, so um, I think iron is something that we do often lack. Um, I was marathon training and I just got completely depleted. Um, and so it's something that I've been using recently. And I have to say, I think it's really helped. And actually that, you know, again, when we were saying about fatigue, you're know, thinking about taking something that's got some iron in it can be useful for, for fatigue too. Absolutely. And um, one thing to remember when people say, oh, I just eat lots of spinach. Spinach might be a lovely thing and it may have iron in it, but it's non-heme iron. If you want to get the iron out of that spinach, you have to add something with vitamin C in it. So eat it with a capsicum or something like that. Um, the oh, last thing... Oh, <laughs> yeah, there you are. <laughs> I'm really worried about my battery. I think my battery's about to go. I'm so sorry. That's all right. We've only got a couple of minutes left anyway. So the last thing I will throw at you very quickly is low libido. What could help with low libido oh, apart from this? Talk about one at the very end. Um, so, you know, uh, being on HRT is, is something that can be enormously beneficial for libido. Um, considering testosterone as part of your HRT um, is, is beneficial and the nice guidance support using testosterone as part of HRT if you've got uh, low libido despite good estrogen. Um, uh, but aside from that, I think that there are, you know, uh, other things to discuss. Libido is such a complex issue that it's not just about hormones. Um, and I think, again, ask yourself the question, is it I have no sexual desire or is it that I don't have any sexual desire for my current partner? Um, you know, is it that I don't have sexual desire for self-pleasure or is it just a lack of uh, sexual desire for sex with other people? Um and, you know, if you can answer some of those questions, that might give you an insight into what's likely to uh, help, I suppose, it, or what, what, what management strategies might be necessary. Um, a lot of people find they're disconnected from their partner, you know, after however many years of being together or if it's a new relationship, it can, you know, relationships can feel quite strained um, at any stage, but even more so at a time in life when actually, um, you know, things are very stressful and difficult. Um, so thinking about how to reconnect with your partner and how to do so in a sensual way that isn't necessarily high pressure um you know touching you know that doesn't necessarily have to lead to sex that just feels good and that, that it feels like you're nourishing the relationship in some way shape or form um and there is a lot of talk about you know use it or lose it um i really don't like that term or phrase but there is an element of truth to it unfortunately and the more sex you have the more likely you are going to have higher sex 
uh, drive and, and, and higher desire. Um, and so, you know, even if you don't have the time, capacity or opportunity to be having sex with a partner on a regular basis, you know, self-pleasure um, and having an orgasm on your own in your own private time as part of your self-care um, might not be a bad thing to consider if you lack even the desire to do that then you know that probably points to there being broader issues that potentially need to be explored either through therapy or through medications such as additional testosterone um, also really important to make sure that any um, genitourinary symptoms are as well managed as possible because obviously if having sex is really uncomfortable then every time you have sex and feel, uh, you know, and, and, and try and enjoy an intimate experience, if it's deeply un uncomfortable and unpleasant, then that's going to provide a very, you know, firm feedback in your brain that that's something that you don't want to, you know, uh, consider again. So definitely, you know, if libido is an issue, also be thinking about vulval and vaginal health, proactively managing that with estrogens if that's available to you or other options if that's not available to you. Um, and thinking about which, you know, whether whether it's all desire that you 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 know you've lost and libido that you've lost or whether there's elements of desire that you, you know are still there that can be nourished in order to get you back on track with you know your partner or a new partner if that's what's necessary <laughs> yeah thank you very much for that um i will end this on here on on the instagram first because i don't want to lose that and we have gone over time so i will say farewell to you there and where where quickly can people find you show if they if they if they want to find you where are you darling so i mean instagram at the menopause medic is probably the most sensible place um to find me um or my website which is www.themenopausemedic.com um and i am going to try much harder to be much better on social media in the next couple of months but <laughs> it's just been a tricky few months I agree. All right, I'm going to end this here on this one. Oh, hello, Kathy. I'm leaving now. I'm about to tell you off. Um, speak to you all soon. And so get that one there. And then I will end this one here for YouTube and everybody else. But thank you again. That was a copy. We covered a lot of territory there. We did. We did. It's always enjoyable, though. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I will see you soon. Take care. Take care, Fiona. Bye bye.